We would like to take a moment to recognize that the land on which the Gohari Crossing State Historic Site currently exists is the ancestral home of the Mohawk people of the Haudenosaunee. We'd like to give thanks to the generations of people who sustain themselves by cultivating these lands, stewarding the waters, and breathing the air, living, as we all must do, to the best of ability. Even while confronted with great change, and we recognize that the Mohawk Valley is still a place where the movement of people and the movement across time should be respected, honored, and remembered. I'd like to thank you for joining us for the Schoharie Crossing State Historic Site, New York State History Month presentation series. I'm Dave, you're the audience, and joining this evening for a presentation, Paul Gorgon is an independent scholar, writer, and researcher from the Mohawk Valley. Recently retired from IBM, he's currently writing about colonial and indigenous history in the Valley, drawing on his own family history, back to the Mohawk people and the early Dutch and German immigrants to the region. He is studying the Mohawk language and serves on the board of directors for the Mohawk community at Fonda, New York, currently as board secretary. Recent publications include several articles on the Mohawks and the Palatine Germans, including one published in a book on German immigration history. His article on Clarissa Putman and Molly Brandt appeared in the Journal of Iroquois in 2017, and his paper on the Mohawk relations with the Dutch in the Mohawk Valley, the subject of this talk, was published this year as a chapter in the book Dutch and Indigenous Communities in 17th Century Northeastern North America by SUNY Press. So please join. Thank you very much, Paul. It's all yours. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for calling in. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to talk about this topic. Um, it's a favorite topic of mine, and I'll be looking at the Mohawk and Dutch uh, relationship there in the Mohawk Valley with a focus on their alliance and its ongoing legacy, uh, some uh, of their diplomatic achievements, and some stories from Mohawk and Dutch families. And I'll also be looking at the return of the Mohawk people uh, to the valley today. I got started on this project a couple of years ago uh, when some good friends of mine, uh, Mohawk elders, were asked to speak at a conference on Dutch relations with indigenous peoples. Uh, my name came up uh, as someone to possibly lead the uh, Mohawk and Dutch discussion, and I gave it my best shot. And then after the conference, the organizers asked for papers for publication. And uh, our book, that Dave mentioned, uh, just came out uh, this spring from SUNY Press. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to be able to uh, uh, give some overview of it and uh, read some excerpts. So uh, this first slide uh, shows the Mohawk leader, Hendrik Teonijo Caragua. And in some ways he personified uh, the Mohawk relationship with the Dutch. Uh, he was a traditional Mohawk leader with an important role in the, the longhouse throughout his life. But also as a young man, he was baptized into the Dutch Reformed Church, where he got the name Hendrik. And he did a lot to bring Dutch and Mohawk uh, people together. Uh, for example, this portrait, it was painted when Hendrik was on a diplomatic mission to London with other native leaders and with the Dutch leader, Peter Schuyler, uh, to um, expand and strengthen their alliance with Great Britain. Uh, they met Queen Anne, and their mission was a great success. And um, I'll talk more about Hendrik and that mission, uh, uh, but uh, and others like them. Uh, but first, <laughs> excuse me. Let me um, let me start with some background on uh, Mohawk history and culture to help put the Dutch era in perspective. So the true name of the Mohawks um, are the Ganyongehaga, the people of Flint. Uh, they keep the eastern boundary uh, for the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy, and their homelands are centered in the Mohawk Valley with trade routes and hunting lands extending uh, far north into Canada, west along the Ohio Valley and, and south to Kentucky. And it's no coincidence that those geographic place names 
And those are all based on Mohawk words and phrases. They, they uh, establish the, the boundaries of their territory. Um, and part of the reason they're called the uh, people of the Flint is that uh, the Mohawk Valley uh, has huge deposits of this very valuable mineral, uh, which was in great demand um, before the Europeans came as the best tool, uh, the best mineral to make tools from. Um, so the Mohawks became adept traders uh, with this commodity and others. They had a huge trade network throughout the Northeast. Um, and that came in very handy later uh, when the fur trade began. But oral history uh, tells us that the Haudenosaunee originally came uh, north uh, from Mesoamerica, where they uh, originally lived among the Maya people eons ago. Um, they crossed the Great Plains into what is now New York, and they brought with them uh, corn, which made it to the Northeast. They brought it, their Iroquois white corn <coughs> is a exact DNA match for corn from the Mayan regions. Um, and when they did settle uh, in the Northeast, uh, they, they were part of a group of five nations, all speaking a similar language, the Mohawks, Anitas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. And eventually they formed a uh, official confederacy with uh, very detailed laws of governance for themselves called the Great Law of Peace. Um, on the social uh, level, uh, Haudenosaunee society is matrilineal uh, with everyone in clans according to their mother's uh, family tree. Uh, the Mohawks primarily have three clans, bears, wolves, and turtles. And uh, each clan has clan mothers who uh, actually choose the chiefs. And they work together with the chiefs to reach consensus on any issues within their clan or their nation or the Confederacy as a whole. Clans also have faith keepers who focus on spiritual matters and performing ceremonies and maintaining the traditional culture. And then at the, at the Confederacy level, there's a grand council of 50 chiefs who settle and deliberate and settle issues at, at the, the international level. And that involves relations with nations outside the Confederacy. And in the early 17th century, uh, that um, set of outsiders suddenly included a, included a large wave of Europeans appearing on, on the borders of Mohawk territory. So the Mohawks had their first contact with Europeans in the early 1600s, uh, with French coming down the St. Lawrence and with Dutch traders coming up the Hudson River. Uh, the encounter with the French was uh, not um, peaceful. Uh, they were, the Mohawks were met with a fusillade of, of gunfire by Champlain and his allies. Uh, but with the Dutch, um, things were much more amenable and uh, it was all about trade. Um, the Dutch were um, only interested in, in commerce. Um, I included the seal of New Netherlands on this slide and as you can see, for them, it was all about the fur trade and the beaver was king. Um, the, the Dutch established a trading post, um, you know, what is now Albany, they called it uh, Beaver, Beverwick. Um, and the French had posts on the St. Lawrence at Quebec and later Montreal. And the land route between those sites and the water route uh, became a major corridor for trade and for diplomacy. Um, the fur trade brought a lot of new tools and weapons, uh, metal tools, um, guns, and uh, knives. And there was an intense competition among the buyers of the furs and the native suppliers um, to uh, control the trade and get the best uh, advantage from it. This led to a lot of conflict that hadn't been there before. And it also led to a lot of uh, peacemaking missions, which we don't hear so much about. The Mohawks actually brokered peace deals for the Dutch with other nations. Um, that was after they became allies with the Dutch. And the Mohawk and Dutch alliance, which was established early on, um, started out as a trade agreement. Um, 
but it grew into one uh, respecting equal sovereignty and shared defense between the two parties. Uh, the Dutch had wanted to be the masters uh, with the natives as their subjects, but the Mohawks said no to that. They set the terms of this relationship as a partnership um, with equality, and they documented that agreement in a wampum belt, which we should see here. The two-row wampum belt has two uh, purple stripes of beads representing the Dutch and the Mohawks, or the Haudenosaunee, traveling side by side, supporting each other, but not interfering with each other's governance, going down the river of life together. And this uh, was the highest standard for a partnership. Uh, and it became the base uh, for all future Haudenosaunee pacts with Europeans. Uh, the Mohawks also extended this alliance to others. They included other native groups in it. And they attempted several times to include the, Fr the French as well. Uh, there's a very important but uh, underappreciated uh, mission that Mohawk leaders went on in 1658 uh, uh, to Quebec um, to uh, include the French in their, in their alliance. And they brought along a Dutch partner, a Dutch army officer named Hendrik Martinson. Uh, and the Mohawk turtle plan leader, Degary Hogan, um, led this embassy and it was very well documented um, in the Jesuit relations document for that year. Um, the leader presented the two row belt to the French and exchanged gifts and pledged a continuous peace. And let me read to you what he said. At their Quebec meeting, the Mohawk leader, Degary Hogan, spake, spoke at length with the French governor, laying out his goals and exchanging gifts in long and precise negotiations aimed to improve their relations. He said, we are seven allied nations, withdraw not from our alliance. All our allies have deputed me to come and get thy agreement. Ojin Diagon, namely the captain of New Holland, is my companion in this embassy. I appoint my country as a place of counsel to which I will gather all our nations. You and myself during five years, which we have had peace, have held each other by the arm. Then Diggory Hoga made 16 points in his speech to the French governor. He made his ninth point with a presentation of the two row wampum belt itself. Describing the belt's design and offering it to the French leader, he said, I put the river in order we and our children will hereafter be a, hereafter be able to navigate it in peace. That is an early and very well documented instance of the use of the two row wampum belt. And it did work um, to establish peace with the French, at least for a time. And this peace mission had a huge impact uh, on the Mohawk and Dutch relations and led to actually a new phase. Because they were now at peace with the French, um, the Mohawks were able to allow the Dutch to um, create a farming settlement within Iroquois borders, where previously no Europeans had settled. This happened in 1661 during that period of peace. You can see from the map that the Mohawks were in the east and that their line crossed the Mohawk River, which is right about where that settlement was created. And it was Schenectady. Um, this was actually a Mohawk and Dutch um, joint venture, the settlement of this town. It has a Mohawk name and was the site of a Mohawk village. It's called Skahnedadi, which means the other side of the pines because it was located on the other side of the pine barrens from Albany. Um, there was a Mohawk and Dutch family living there before the other Dutch came along the Van Slyke family. Um, and their site was very important and strategic for defense as well as trade because uh, it was located at, uh, at the end of the portage route where um, uh, furs would be offloaded from the river and then carried on land um, through the Pine Barrens to Albany, thus avoiding Cohoes Falls. 
So it was to everyone's benefit to have a, um, a fortified town there, which the, the Dutch were able to help provide. And uh, not only was it a joint venture, but the settlement had a very mixed um, blended population. There were a lot of Mohawks living there along with the Dutch. And here's a little bit about that Dutch family that, that led to the creation of Schenectady. Um, in 1680, uh, a Dutch visitor uh, met the Van Slyke children and uh, documented their story in his journal. Uh, there were two older siblings alive at the time, August Van Slyke and his sister Hillity, and their nephew Wouter. Uh, Agus and Hillity were the children of a Dutch official named Cornelius Van Slyke and Oji Stohwa, a Mohawk woman from Kanajahari. Agus um, was um, a fur trader primarily, but he also was farming at Schenectady. And after the Dutch came, uh, he had established uh, himself as a tavern keeper. Um, Hillity was a fervent Christian. Uh, she had converted um, as a young person, um, had left the Mohawk community and lived among the Dutch, and was now actively recruiting other Mohawks to join the Dutch church. And then between the two of them was their nephew, Wooter, who was struggling to fit into either society. Um, a lot of their Mohawk relatives by that time were anti-Dutch, having had a lot of bad experiences, and they, they told a bit about it to the, the Dutch traveler. Again, I can read some of what they said. So Hillity had suffered verbal abuse from the Dutch. Um, people less religious than she were mocking her aspirations and also her ethnicity. Uh, she was called a pig or a sow, a sow converted, and was directed to the nearest tavern for swill when she ventured to criticize Dutchmen who were, um, um, just, they were um, displaying lewd behavior in front of her small children. And she told the, the Dutch traveler all about that. Uh, that was fairly typical of some of her experience, even though she was uh, working hard to um, to join the Dutch church. It was it was kind of backfiring on her. Um, her brother August, um, he took a lot of heat from the Dutch as well. Uh, he was criticized for having Wouter work for him as a fur, as a fur trapper, and for not teaching him Dutch for only speaking Mohawk with him as he spoke with his own family. And Wouter um, had wanted to leave and join a Dutch religious sect and August was very skeptical about that. And so Wouter was caught in between the worlds, the European and Mohawk worlds, and he lost his sense of direction. And he said, I am like a man who has three knives, but has lost the one he has most need of and without which the others are of little use. He had lost his, his sense of direction. And the story did not end well for Wooter. He actually drops out of the local records after 1680 and apparently disappeared or, or died en route um, to join up with this Dutch traveler, Jasper Denkers. They were going to meet in Boston so that Wooter could uh, sail to Holland with them. But he never made it. He never appeared. And he never appeared again in Schenectady. And at the end of his journal, uh, Denker very callously, I think, sort of wrote him off. He says, Denker simply, simply shrugs off Wooter's disappearance, writing, we must offer up our poor Indian to the pleasure of the Lord. So not all Mohawk and Dutch uh, experiences were, were best for both. Certainly the Mohawks did not always turn out um, the beneficiaries of their dealings. But despite these setbacks, rough treatment by Dutch traders, which was also common, and land use disputes, the Dutch and the Mohawk remained allies uh, and partners um, 
Dutch courts did uphold Mohawk sovereignty and the question came up and uh, trespassers on Mohawk territory were, were punished in, in the Dutch court system. Um, their peace with France did not last long and they were soon set upon with French raids into the valley, which destroyed local villages four times in, in short order at, toward the end of that era. Um, that was Mohawk and French uh, and uh, Dutch uh, villages being burned. Uh, Schenectady was burned in 1690. And immediately afterward, Mohawks led a rescue mission to try to save captives. They also held traditional Mohawk condolence ceremonies uh, to draw the Dutch survivors back to rebuild. Uh, a condolence ceremony is intended to raise the spirits of a grieving family uh, to help them continue their lives again the way their loved ones would have wanted them to. A very powerful experience. Uh, there were two of these ceremonies held for the Dutch uh, victims of uh, Schenectady, and they succeeded. The, the Dutch did go back to rebuild the, the town, and the Mohawks helped them rebuild it, and they attended the Dutch, the rebuilt Dutch church as well. Um, there are some pictures of forts that were drawn at the time. Uh, original uh, drawings by a visitor. In 1695, Schenectady was being rebuilt, and there's a drawing of the, the stockade fort on the left here. It's got, um, let's see if I can get my cursor to work. Yep. Um, houses, barns, and most importantly, two large longhouses inside the stockade. These were for the Mohawk defenders who were help, helping uh, defend against another French attack. And likewise, there was a, a native fort on the river uh, flats, either near Schenectady or closer to Albany, but it had five large longhouses, and they're shown here in great detail how many doorways they had. Um, you can see that they're oval-shaped um, the one in the middle, uh, the, the artist uh, showed the inside as well. You can see where the fireplaces were. Um, this fort, primarily occupied by Native people, also had European guardhouses. Uh, so there was a mutual defense system going on. It was very well advised um, because the French had come back and burned Mohawk villages just two years before. And in addition to the forts, there's other source material that shows how close the Mohawks and Dutch had become in Schenectady. The church records, the Dutch Reformed Church of Schenectady um, has records from that era which contain hundreds of Mohawk names. Um, and this is a typical uh, page of baptisms uh, from 1700. Um, when the village was being restored and children were being born again. And it's sort of written from the minister's point of view as a top-down record with prominent people at the top. Um, uh, but I, I translated it. It's, in, it's all in Dutch. I translated it into English and put it in table form and found that you could actually um, see it through a two-row lens just with a slight overlay. So there's what this looks like. And I hope you can see all the fields. Um, at the top, there are some European families. Um, the Van Epps family and the Glenn family are um, here uh, christening their, uh, their um, son, John ba Jan Baptiste Van Epps. Um, there's another strictly uh, Dutch family um, below that. Um, but then in, in the, the two row view of things, um, there's a whole section of, of um, blended families. Um, you can see Hillity herself, Hillity Cornelius here. She's a sponsor in the third row, along with her nephew, Cornelius, um, a sponsor for her um, her nieces, her great nieces, who are a, a pair of twins uh, born to her niece, uh, Gritia Van Slyke, 
who was Akis Van Slyke's daughter. Akis had passed away just after the, the French attack, so he's not in this in this picture. Um, then below that, uh, there are um, other families with Mohawk relatives. The Boersboom family um, was related to the Lower Mohawk Village. That's documented in a in a land deed. Um, then you get a Van Epps family again um, with uh, Derek Brott, another family that had a lot of uh, Mohawk relatives, um, as did uh, the Mebby family, the next row down. Jan Mebby was, was married to Anna Boersboom with a connection to the lower village. Then you see uh, the mother of the twins, Greetia Van Slyke, is showing up in the next row as a sponsor for um, a Mohawk woman and her daughter, Dina who was married to an uh, Englishman named Jonathan Stevens. Below that, the Philipson family, they were uh, Moorish from North Africa, uh, but with uh, Dutch relatives. And below that, we're into the Mohawk section. These are strictly Mohawk families. So I couldn't resist putting this in two-row form. Uh, the top row here in the Mohawk section is a a chief named Onego Hiriago and his wife, Louisa. They are baptizing their daughter, Louisa. And the sponsor is a, a significant woman in the Mohawk tribe, Moazet Tasama. I'll tell more about her. Um, as she is probably Louisa's sister or cousin as a sole sponsor of their daughter. Then there's a, a Mohawk girl named Mary uh, being baptized, and her sponsor is a Dutch woman named Mary Groot. Probably the younger Mary is named for her. So the church records show very clearly how closely related everyone was, and even if there was a separation um, by ethnicity, people were mingling in, in every way. Um, there was there's really no separation uh, among the population. Also, what's interesting to me is that um, one person, one parent on this page would go on to play a major role on a world stage. And uh, uh, just as a hint, he is not in the top row, not one of the Europeans. Instead, it's that chief Onego Hiriago, Johannes Onego Hiriago. Um, he was a Wolf Clan chief from Kanajahari, uh, married to Louisa, who was a Turtle Clan mother from Tainandaroga. Their daughter, Louisa, who later appears as Lois, uh, is in both the Schenectady church records and those of Fort Hunter. And why was there a Fort Hunter? Now, we haven't heard of that yet. The reason is that Johannes went along with Hendrik to England to that embassy with Queen Anne. And part of their negotiations was to get fortifications built in their own villages. And Fort Hunter was the result. They negotiated the creation of Fort Hunter and it was built right in Johannes's, uh, well, his wife's home village. So they had a major impact. Um, Fort Hunter being where Schoharie Crossing is today. Now, Louisa's sponsor, Moisette, she also made history in, in winning battles with, with Dutch authority. Here are some records. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of her, but I have records of her from the Dutch church. Um, she was a protege of Hillity Van Slyke, and uh, through perseverance, she broke through a, what was a, basically a de facto ban on Mohawk and Dutch marriages in the Albany Dutch Church, which led to many more such mixed marriages in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, the first record here, which I hope you can see, is um, in Dutch. It's her, her baptism record. She was baptized as a young person at 20 years old. And you could tell she was getting things done on her own terms. Um, the minister made a note. Um, that um, she did not take uh, a biblical name at baptism. She kept her own name, Moisette, which is apparently her mother's name. This had never been done for any native baptism in the Albany church. Um, 
And then the record below that um, shows um, the baptism of her first child um, also that same year in 1696. Um, you can see next to the Roman numeral um, 27, Johannes. That was her son. Moaset, that's her name, as listed as the parent. Hillity, who we've met before, she is listed as a sponsor. But there's no father in this picture. Moaset was not yet married, and the minister was not happy. He made a note in Dutch underneath Johannes' name, saying that, uh, in in Onech Gaboren, uh, this child is illegitimate. Um, we are baptizing him, but his parents are not married. His father is a Christian. In other words, he's a European, but he hadn't he hadn't married Moaseth. But that didn't stop her. She got her son baptized and got him listed in the in the church book, even though there's this this note about it. Um, she kept trying, and she did manage to get well, basically a church marriage just before her daughter was born. The minister actually had an alderman do the wedding. For some reason, he still wasn't up to it, um, but he entered that wedding in the church book. And when her daughter was born, she got, Moaset got significant Dutch sponsors for them. Philip Schuyler, Peter Schuyler, Maria Van Rensselaer, um, Jeremias Van Rensselaer was the sponsor of her third child. He was the patroon for the Rensselaer colony. So she made sure to make her mark. And after that, Mohawk and Dutch marriages did happen, especially in the Mohawk Valley. So someone to be reckoned with, Moaset Tassama. And one more family story. Uh, this is a young man. Well, when he was young, he was uh, taken by the French in 1690, Lawrence van der Volga. He was, what, 12 years old at the time? Uh, one of those captives uh, taken to Canada. <clears throat> but when he was in Canada, he lived there with the Mohawks, and he lived there for 10 years. He learned Mohawk. It became his first language. Um, and he came back to Schenectady just for a brief visit 10 years later. <clears throat> he was dressed as a Mohawk, speaking Mohawk, had his hair braided in a Mohawk fashion. The story goes that while he was asleep, his sister, who didn't want him to go back, cut off his braid. And he would not return back to the village without it, because only someone in deep personal mourning would ever cut their hair. Well, while it grew back, he, he met his future wife in Schenectady, and he chose to stay behind in the Dutch village. Uh, but he kept up his connections with the Mohawks. He went on to serve as the leading Mohawk Dutch interpreter in the Mohawk Valley. Um, as, besides being an interpreter at conferences, he also translated books. And there's one of them from 1710, probably the oldest Mohawk book in existence there in the Schenectady County Historical Society, as is this portrait of him. And also his beautiful porcupine quill um, tobacco bag, they have that in their collection as well. And he was given uh, land by the Mohawks and thanks for his service as a translator. They gave him, Lawrence was given three islands in, in the Mohawk River. So those family vignettes, I hope show again, how close the relationships were. Um, there were political changes during this time. Uh, the Dutch ceded New Netherlands, um, but the Mohawks just extended their alliance to the British along with the local Dutch population. Um, also, the Mohawks were, were busy taking in other groups being displaced uh, by settlement elsewhere. Mohicans who were driven out during King Philip's War, they were given sanctuary in, in um, Scaticoke, New York, in Mohawk territory. Uh, Palatine Germans, refugees um, who came through Great Britain, um, 
to the Mon to the Hudson Valley. Uh, when their um, settlement there fell apart, the Mohawks gave them land in Schoharie. The Lenape people were given land in the Southern Catskills on upper, upper uh, Delaware River. And Tuscaroras who were displaced from the Carolinas, they became uh, a new nation of the Confederacy, the sixth nation of, of the Haudenosaunee under that great law of peace. And alliances were also being built at the time through marriage and adoption within families. There was another Hendrick Hendrick Peters, um, who was born to a Mohawk clan, bear clan mother and a Mohican father. He went on to become a Mohawk leader. A Mohican uh, leader named Nicholas, uh, who was married to a Mohawk turtle clan mother. Uh, he was another one who went to uh, London with Hendrick and Johannes. And there's Molly Brandt, um, who became a partner of the British leader, Sir William Johnson. And, and had a very strong influence on, on British policy. So alliances grew in, in many ways on different levels. Now here are the diplomats, the four who went to London with Hendrik. Uh, they traveled with the Dutch uh, mayor of Albany, Peter Schuyler, uh, to uh, solidify their alliance with England and uh, attain uh, forts and reinforcements against the French. Um, they were quite a sensation in London at the time. Um, there had never been a visit like theirs. Um, they were called the Four Kings and they were treated like royalty. Uh, just to go through their names, there's uh, on the upper left, that's Hendrik, who we saw in the first slide. Uh, on the upper right is uh, Brandt, Brant Sagwakwam Garaktum. His name means the disappearing smoke. He had a, a major Mohawk ceremonial role. Uh, Johannes, uh, who we met before, he's on the lower left. You can see his tattoos a little more clearly in this picture. Um, and then the uh, Mohican chief, Nicholas, uh, who was married to the Mohawk clan mother, he is on the lower right. Um, they uh, were there for intense negotiations with the British. Um, they parlayed their sovereignty and their military power against the French um, very successfully in, into an agreement where the British would build a fort in the Mohawk Lower Village. Um, they would build a chapel in the fort. Uh, they would send a minister and um, and reinforcements to uh, to barricade or, or to garrison the fort. Um, a very successful move on on, on, their, on the Mohawks uh, diplomatic front. And actually, at that point, the creation of Fort Hunter, uh, most of the Mohawk religious uh, records are kept at that new chapel, and, and many many fewer in Schenectady and Albany because this. Fort and chapel were right in their home village. Um, the French were finally defeated by the British, Dutch, and Mohawks in 1763. And, and finally, there was a lasting peace. Um, but that also led to increased settlement in the Mohawk Valley. That and the end of the fur trade um, led to a lot of um, land sales that the Mohawks were forced to make uh, many fraudulent land sales. Um, the Mohawks were assiduous about keeping up their alliance, uh, especially with Britain through William Johnson. Um, but that cost more land. Um, most of the Mohawk territory was opened up for European settlement under Johnson's Treaty of 1768. He drew the line of settlement at the, at the Oneida border so the, the Mohawk land was all in the European zone. And, and Johnson enriched himself from this. Um, he, he ended up owning 170,000 acre plantation um, with lots of slaves and hundreds of poor tenants. He was following more a British model of domination rather than the equal partnership that the Mohawks had with the Dutch. 
In fact, he uh, broke the rule of the two row and interfered in uh, Haudenosaunee governance and tried to play a role in the, which chiefs were chosen. Um, and this had a um, this interference uh, undermined um, the Haudenosaunee uh, power. Uh, it was divided during the American Revolution. Uh, officially, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy uh, was neutral, but groups were pulled in on both sides, uh, especially under the influence of Johnson's son, John Johnson. Um, most of the Mohawks um, were on the British side, and there ended up being a disastrous civil war and displacement throughout the Mohawk Valley. That Sullivan campaign that will be the topic of the next talk uh, was a big part of that. After the war, the Treaty of Paris completely ignored the Haudenosaunee. The Americans and the British left out their allies from that agreement. And so uh, most of the Mohawk Valley residents all of the Haudenosaunee in that area were evicted, basically forced to move to Canada or, or along the border, even the ones who had been on the American side. Uh, there was no provision for them to have any land. Uh, that was partly corrected in 1794 when George Washington signed a treaty with the Six Nations. And he recognized them as independent nations with permanent land rights. But most of the Mohawks had already left the valley and the state. And in New York, in 1797, New York State took the remaining unceded Mohawk land. And that was a completely shady deal, uh, not really authorized by the Mohawk uh, leadership or the Haudenosaunee Grand Council, and certainly not ratified by the US government. So that land is, is still um, contested. To this day. And since 1797, basically over 200 years, uh, there was a very harsh reality for the Mohawks. Of, um, they had an imposed government system brought in by Canada and by the US, and children were routinely stolen and, and put into uh, residential schools to make them forget or hate their, their culture and their language. Uh, but the people survived and there was a strong prophecy that uh, they would return to the homelands and to their traditional ways. And after 200 years, that did actually happen. The Ganyongehaga people fulfilled that prophecy and moved back to the valley in 1993 and established a community called Kanachokalege near Fonda, New York, um, led by Tom Porter, Sagak and uh, many others. And the community is there now on a 200 acre farm. It is a territory dedicated to preserving the language and the culture and returning them to their original home in the Mohawk Valley. And Ganajohalege plays a major role throughout the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's a gathering place and a center for the cultural revival of the whole Confederacy there in the Mohawk Valley. There are seven other Mohawk communities scattered in Northern New York and Canada. Uh, and in a way, Ganajohalege and his eighth community is their common ground where people come to gather for ceremonies and for language classes and uh, for uh, just renewal of their culture. And the two-row treaty has been adopted by the community as a model for relations uh, with the Europeans again. Here's a great illustration of that. Uh, Tom is holding the two-row wampum belt. This was brought uh, to the community um, by a group of young paddlers who started at Onondaga and came down the river um, as part of a major campaign to revive the Turo wampum back in 2013. 
I happened to be there uh, for language class at the time, and I, I got this wonderful uh, iconic photo. And um, with this uh, reappearance of the two row, the Mohawk and Dutch Alliance has been back again on the world stage because the second stage of that trip in 2013 um, was a, a large uh, canoe uh, trip down the Hudson River uh, to the UN. And um, there at the UN, the Dutch Consul General um, met with Haudenosaunee leaders and uh, in, in honor of the treaty, um, there was a meeting of recognition. And at the UN, um, I was able to attend a session uh, with member states and Ban Ki-moon and uh, um, the Secretary of for human rights, um, all about the two row wampum. Uh, Oren Lyons is um, a Onondaga faith keeper, and uh, he's on the right in this, this first picture with the Dutch consul. Uh, and in the other picture, he is presenting the two row to the UN, explaining its significance. And at that meeting, uh, the Secretary for Human Rights announced the new UN policy of defending treaty rights for indigenous peoples as human rights for um, all future treaties. And this uh, meeting went on beyond the UN. Um, this was in, uh, I think, August that we had the UN meeting, and then See if I can get to the next slide. In September, um, Mohawk and Onondaga elders were invited um, to Holland for events to honor the, the treaty, which at that point was 400 years old. And very significantly, they traveled on their Haudenosaunee passports, not Canadian or US passports, traveling as citizens of, of sovereign nations according to that treaty. There was a ceremony at The Hague, and Oren Lyons spelled out the treaty's ongoing significance, and spelled it out as best as anyone can. The Dutch were the first to come to our territories and request a trade agreement. Our leaders observed that you were not going home anytime soon. They suggested that rather than just a trade agreement, we should establish a relationship. This resulted in the Gaswanta, the Turo Wampum Treaty. With you and your ship and we and our canoes flowing side by side down the river of life and peace friendship, for as long as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, as long as the waters flow downhill, and as long as the grass grows green, this is the grandfather of all subsequent treaties in North America. The treaty was essentially reaffirmed. And we're living it all the time today in the Mohawk Valley. At Ganachohalege, we have these language classes to restore the Mohawk language, which almost died out. It's growing now. You see there are a lot of kids involved learning it. Um, this was uh, another great photo of a class in 2012. And, and uh, like every event there, it, it, it really reflects the, the two row. There's, there's a, almost an equal mix of uh, Haudenosaunee people and, and people of European descent. Um, the, the, the teachers are in the, in the first row. Um, in the second row, some of the young people have gone on to become teachers themselves um, at a secondary level. And also one of them is now teaching Mohawk at McGill University. And then in the back row, the old gray haired guys are just uh, keeping up as best we can. That's me on the far right. And then behind us, just by chance, uh, are portraits of the four kings. And I think essentially we're all standing on their shoulders. Yeah. 
one more picture from the community. Uh, we have an annual strawberry festival in June in 2019. Well, that was the last one that we had in person before COVID hit. Um, but, but after all the events were over at that festival, uh, the, the crew and some of the performers who were left got together for this uh, great group photo. And we did not plan to form two rows. It just came naturally. But in, in the true two row form, we're all mixed up together in those two rows. It isn't just one one group and another. It's all one group. So that's the story. Um, the past brought right up to the present. And uh, here's uh, having uh, great hopes for the future. And here is the book, uh, which has all this information and much more. So uh, if you get a chance to take a look, uh, it's available through SUNY Press. Um, and, and Dave has a link to it, I think. Another great uh, painting by Len Tantillo there, by the way, on, on the cover called the, the Curiosity of the Magua, the Mohawks, who came out to meet the Dutch in, in 1613. And now we know what happened, where it went from there. Finally, I want to say Nyawangoa, which is many thanks and acknowledgements to Mohawk friends and elders and others who helped me with this. Uh, in particular, Kay Olin, the renowned storyteller and Mohawk teacher. Uh, Tom Porter, who is Mo Mohawk Bear Clan, a spiritual leader and executive director for Ganachohalege. Uh, Laura Lee, the archivist at Schenectady First Reformed Church, let me look at the original records and make copies. Uh, Jan Longboat is a Mohawk elder and consular from Six Nations in Ontario, and she read an early version of the chapter and gave me great input. Um, Oren Lyons, the Turtle Clan faith keeper, the Onondaga diplomat, uh, he and I spoke uh, many times during the two row and He's been a great inspiration. Um, and Doug George and John Fadden are Mohawk scholars and historians who also uh, helped me with the manuscript. And last, not least, I want to thank my own relatives in this story, um, ancestors and relatives. Hendrik Martinson, who went with Diggory Hogan to Quebec as his translator. His Mohawk name is Ojin Yago, and he is my eighth great grandfather. Moaset Tasama, she is a great aunt, far removed in the past, as are Hilati Agus and Wooter. Those are all family cousins of mine. So to them, I have to say, Miawa Goa Dewa Dadego. Thank you, my relatives. All right, so that's it for me. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Paul. Um, uh, those that are tuning in on the on the WebEx, if you have some questions, put them up in the chat. I'll moderate through those. Uh, nothing come through so far, but uh, I really appreciate this great research that you're doing. Uh, it's wonderful that those archival records still exist mm -hmm. and that researchers like yourself uh, have access to them and are still conducting the research that is uh, desperately needed uh, to further tell the story um, to connect all of us once again i, th I think is a, a great point to be had um, so i made a couple of little notes uh waiting for people if there's any questions that want to come through we have a small group that's actually uh at the visitor center uh Scohe crossing as part of a meeting they, they're they're also connected on this as well um, so if they have any questions, Katie can type that through. Um, but I, I, I made a couple of notes just to kind of like, you know, spark whatever level of, of conversation, but hopefully if there's other stuff, uh, people will ask. Um, but you know, everything from, uh, the baptismal records, I love that, that you organized it in a way that it, it makes it, uh, in that format easier to kind of connect with, particularly if we don't speak Dutch. Um, yeah. and, uh, there's just really the, the tremendous 
uniqueness of those blended families and the level in which those sponsors can be within those families uh, that mm -hmm. you noted. Uh, there's some really well-known people as sponsors. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and they 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 did a, a lot to to bring the bring everyone together and uh, validate uh, everyone's experience. And uh, there was the I might I'm going to try my best. I I'm not very good at anything. I'm not even really great at speaking English, as is probably evidenced by those listening. Uh, but Vandervolg, uh, his story sounds uh, actually like could be a really good movie plot. Like you wouldn't have to change or fictionize much. Um, no. Oh no, you you wouldn't. No, I would love to see that that in in a in a, in a movie. Yeah, there's. It, it seems like there's a great yeah, amount of adventure. All... There's even kind of a love story that's in in there already. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, a lot of drama there. There's a, a question coming through from Andrea asking uh, to explain what exactly was a sponsor. Ah, uh, yes. Um, so in the in the Dutch church, that was the equivalent of a um, a godparent, uh, someone who would be responsible for the the child's uh, religious education, and someone to watch out for them. And so, getting the the Van Rensselaers uh, was was a, a real coup. Uh, and it, it's great that they they made that they made that connection. Yeah, that's a that's a who's who of Skinetti on, on a lot of that. So that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I guess maybe this is kind of a question that that might be a little bit outside of some of this, and maybe it's just mostly kind of your opinion if you if you choose to kind of answer this. But during that early 1700s, that really uh, period there where there is a lot more in-depth, I guess, um, cultural uh, conglomeration that's occurring uh, in some way, shape, or another. You, you mentioned that there's bringing in of the, the Tuscarora from the Carolinas and the Lenape are coming in and uh, the Palatines are settling. Uh, do you get any sort of a sense from some of the research you've done of, of sort of at that contemporary moment, any thoughts toward if there's an a concern about, I guess, um, uh, cultural or hereditary dilution from that? Um, I don't think there was any at the time. I think that adoption was a really strong tradition um, within families and then also, you know, within uh, nations. The idea was that if you had an empty room, part of your territory was un unoccupied. Um, it was good to make it available to others you know, if they would fit under the, the law, of, if they would follow the law of peace. Um, there was a definitely a mutual beneficial kind of arrangement. Uh, within families, uh, adoption was important because of the, the, the decimating epidemics um, and then the conflicts that were brought on by the beaver trade, the beaver wars. Um, families would lose half their members. And so, um, Adopting was was a way of keeping your family going. In fact, the tradition was that you would be adopted, you know, and take on a new identity uh, of someone who had passed away. And uh, as um, John Fadden explained it to me, um, you would take on that identity and you wouldn't talk about your old one. And for some families, uh, this became, uh, and for the whole nation, adoption brought in a lot of uh, strong, you know, strong allies and talent. And um, for example, in the book, I mentioned one of the other families, um, the, um, the Shenandoah family. Uh, Shenandoah is, is not a Mohawk name. It's related to, to a Haudenosaunee language. It, um, but it's uh, people from the Susquehannock um, society. Um, that's a, a man who was adopted. And he later became a great chief, and his name is is a very prominent name now within the Haudenosaunee. Leon Shenandoah was uh, the the late leader of uh, of the Grand Council. Joanne Shenandoah is a world class singer from the United Nation. Uh, so adoption was powerful and popular and brought in all this, this you know, um, 
uh, this this uh, new blood, to, to, so to speak, um, people who could help. I don't remember ever hearing about um, you know a feeling that it would dilute it would dilute the the nation, only that it would be a way of strengthening it. Um, so, so without me editorializing at all, uh, I think that that's something that uh, in modern American society, we should all have an understanding of. Uh, but again, I won't editorialize any further on that one. Uh, we have a question coming in from Kim. Are the baptism records available for research uh, to find ancestors? I believe they are going to be online. I'll have to um, check, or you could check with um, with Laura Lee at the uh, Reformed Church in Schenectady. Well, it's um, funny you say that because Laura is actually on, and she just posted okay. the records of the first reform. Yeah. Was connected will soon be available online. Okay, <laughs> that's what I heard. Wonderful, thank you, Laura. That's good. I'm waiting to see them. I was very lucky to be able to look at them in person, but having them online will be even better. It's going to open up uh, a lot of doors for a lot of people doing wonderful research out there. Although, yes, yeah. there's. Uh, online research is great, especially during the age of COVID, but there's there's far things better than physically being at an archives and seeing the actual documents uh, and, and noting that uh, hundreds of years ago, perhaps, that someone else's hands were creating what you're reading. Uh, it's, it's a moving experience in and of itself. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting a message that someone wanted to annotate the shared content. I don't know if that's meant to be a a question or not? I, um, yeah. Would I approve that or decline it? Um, we, we won't at this this moment. We're far enough along, and uh, we'll we'll save any options like that for the recording uh, for transcripts okay. and annotations. Okay. Um, oh, there was a there was a comment. I saw it briefly. <laughs> uh, but there's Andrea saying that some Haudenosaunee. Uh, from Six Nations in Canada came down to participate in the two row on the Hudson event in 2013, paddling on the Hudson from Albany, New York City. Um, and I, I absolutely, it's, uh, do you happen to know if there's a, at any point uh, another time in which they're hoping to to do that uh, again? Um, no, I haven't heard. I haven't heard. I, I was kind of hoping there might be a 10th anniversary event, but I haven't heard. Um, and yeah, there was one done on the Grand River in Ontario a few years later. That was that was that was good to see. But yeah, there were people from all the Mohawk communities on that uh, on at least the Hudson River part of that trip, and uh, and also on the Mohawk River there were people from the other nations as well. Um, good. Yeah, if I get a chance, I'll show this hilarious. Well, not hilarious. This this iconic photograph from the two row, um, which I, I was gonna share on my screen. Let's see if I can find it. Right. Um, but I would like to point out, I, I've been quite grateful and, and honestly, it's uh, it's been an, an enrichment for my own uh, life, just not only this presentation, but other interactions that I've had with you in person. Um, sometimes I spent at the strawberry festivals, I was involved uh, for a couple of years when there was a Haudenosaunee film festival that occurred there. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and quite honestly, particularly uh, standing in that kitchen, helping make lemonade uh, with, with Nikki and, and interactions with everybody. It just, I, as an outsider, admittedly, uh, you know, I, I felt as part of the family. So uh, <laughs> I'm eternally grateful uh, for those experiences and hope that the future will yield several more of those. Oh, for sure. And yeah, thank you, David, for all your help with that film festival and being there. Um, yeah, that is the, that is the most way to make everyone feel a part of things at home. Were, were you able to find that, that image? Um, let's see, I've got to get out of um, PowerPoint mode here. Not positive. I'm going to get there. Oh, I might have. Let's see. Um, and, uh, somewhere in here, where is it? I'm getting some thank yous that are coming through on the uh, on the chat, and as well as a few of the private ones that have come in to me uh, specifically. Thank you for the presentation; this great amount of information. Uh, I'm hoping that the folks uh, back at the visitor center uh, are enjoying the program as well. And thank you to those who have tuned in. 
for this presentation. Um, as Paul's trying to find this image that I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining in this evening for the WebEx presentation as we celebrate, or at least recognize New York State History Month. Uh, it's a Schoharie Crossing presentation series that we hold now in October, because that is when History Month is now, not November. Um, Well, not having too much luck. Um, maybe I can uh, send it around later. But it's a great picture of the uh, the, the Dutch ship that came along with us on the two row. Um, at lunchtime, um, a couple of native guys had to paddle out uh, on a kayak carrying the pizza boxes for the guy in the Dutch church on the Dutch ship. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> I yeah. I would appreciate I, looking at that if you want to send it uh when you send it around, that'd be great. I will find it and send it. You bet. Thank you very much. And great. Okay. Paul, I, I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Thanks to those that joined in. Um yep. thank you. My pleasure. Take care everyone. Be well. Be safe. Oh, no.